Welcome back everybody, my name is Tim. This is another Real Ideal Gear Review and this video is for people interested in Casio watches and the top 10 things that you really should consider before buying another Casio watch. Now to kind of lay the groundwork for this, there are so many models of Casios out there. I had an interesting question that came to my mind anyway that was, how many models has Casio ever made? And so I've been looking over the internet trying to find that and I can't find that answer to that specific question on the internet anywhere that I've looked. I did find, however, some places where it did show some insight as far as what the first few decades were like, um, also the G-Shocks. And so just to kind of give you an idea of what those models looked like as far as the number, the sheer volume of models that Casio has made, they've made over 4,200 G-Shock models since the inception of the G-Shock. 4,200 G-Shocks since the inception. Since 1974 until about the mid 90s, the number of models that I was able to piece together over that uh, what would be 20 year span was about just under 2000 models. Now that might have included some of those pre G-Shock models or even some G-Shock models in there as well. But you get the idea that Casio has been putting out all kinds of different models. And so to navigate through this, you really need to have a game plan because there's a lot of different features and functions that have shown up in Casio watches over the decades. For instance, 1974 was the first Casio watch called the Casiotron. In the 1980s, they came out with a 100 meter water resistant watch that really opened up Casio to the athletic world. Then in 1991, they came out with a data bank with a touchscreen. Now, when you think about the touchscreen technology, often people start thinking about the Apple, uh, I, the Apple iPod was kind of the first touchscreen, the mass-produced touchscreen thing that was out there. But in 1991, Casio had this data bank touchscreen technology. Then in 2000, they came out with the wrist camera. So this is a watch that you could have uh, a camera on, and it would actually show you the photographs that you would take on the watch itself. Pretty interesting. Then in 2012, the Bluetooth technology was at the forefront. And the Bluetooth technology allowed for instant watch updates as far as the time and the date. It also allowed for notifications of emails and phone calls. And that was in 2012. So Casio has been at the forefront, at the leader really, of innovations in technology, let alone technologies that were packed into a watch. So here are the 10 things that I think you should really consider before buying another Casio watch. So before buying your Casio watch, I think there are 10 things that you need to consider to help you with that purchase because there just are so many options, as I mentioned before. The models that are out there are plentiful and there are some subtle nuances between all of these Casio watches that I think are worth noting and having some kind of organization to that uh, search for a Casio watch or for a new Casio watch or your first Casio watch it would be helpful to know what those kind of things are. So let's go through these. There's a little bit of an order to this, but once you get past the first couple, they're kind of, you know, you mix and match the last seven or eight of these down the line. So number one is budget. You need to have a good idea of what your budget is. Your budget is going to determine a lot of things about Casio watches, and that's not anything new. That's the way it is generally with anything that you buy. Your budget's going to determine some of the quality, some of the characteristics, some of the functions, uh, some of the materials that are going to be used, those kind of things. So determining your budget. So if you if you stick with, within your budget, I think you're going to find that Casio has a bunch, a lot of, of models for you to choose from. So that's an obvious number one. Number two, let's go with how is this watch going to be used? Uh, determine like what's the overall primary purposes of this watch. You're going to find that when you get a Casio watch, if it's your first one or if your second or third or 20th one, if there's a purpose that you're trying to fulfill, maybe you have a collection and you're looking for certain specific models to fulfill that collection as far as the continuity of a collection, okay? But if you're moving into more of the application and use of the Casio watch, you really want to be aware of what it is that you're going to do with the watch. So for me, for example, I have a lawn maintenance business. So 
you know, the vibration of gas powered tools, being out in the sunlight, um, dealing with rain, dealing with sprinkler systems. Um, so there's water, there's UV light, there's also the vibration. So the G-Shock kind of thing might be helpful. Um, there's a lot of different things about a lawn maintenance ba business that lends itself to, I need a tougher watch. I need a watch that has certain um, waterproof level. It needs to have a certain battery. It needs to have a certain shock proof or just the ability to withstand some of those shocks. Um, those kind of things are all part of why I would have a Casio. Now, would I wear a Casio outside of work? Probably not. Maybe for camping and hiking. Um, I have my Casio Pathfinder. Love this watch. This is a great, great outdoor watch. So yeah, I'm going to be wearing this for the hiking, camping, and, and mountaineering type of thing. But outside of that, I'm not really wearing these watches for a lot of other occasions. So it really becomes a work focus for me. So that's something that I would do if I was going to look at this watch as far as how am I going to wear this watch. Now, I want to point out one thing that Casio does have certain models that, uh, like for instance, the Casio, which is the GAB2100, or also just an analog watch. They make plenty of analog watches like the Duro. And, uh, you know, it, there's just a lot of different options that are out there. So keep in mind that Casios don't just mean the classic digital watch, okay? You can get a bunch of different things that have a little bit more of a flair or a function to them that I think really can be helpful when it comes down to just kind of dressing up and using the watch in more than just work situations. Maybe this is more of a casual situation, office situation, work in week you know, you're, you're working the weekend kind of a thing in the, in the home garden or something like that. So yeah, there's plenty of options, I think, for that, but you need to identify what it is that you're going to be using the watch for. Next up is going to be strap and strap quality, strap characteristics, the material workmanship that goes into the strap, the keeper, the buckle, that kind of thing. So when you get a, a really basic watch, let's talk about the F91W here. You're going to get a very basic strap and the strap itself is really short. So when you compare this to another watch that is of similar size, similar function and price, uh, both of these are within that $20 range, the F91, probably more in the $15 range. Some people can get them for 10. But when you look at the strap, the overall length of the strap, which means for a guy like me, the F91 just does not fit real well on my wrist because it has, I think I've got, yeah, I've got three holes left at the very end, which means the keeper, is really got a lot of pressure on it. And if the keeper slips off, I'm gonna have this end of the strap just sticking out, catching on things. So for me, a longer strap is better because the keeper, this, this piece that slides up and down, does a better job. Now the buckle is another one. So if you get into a G-Shock, you're automatically gonna get a stainless steel buckle, a metal buckle like this one right here in the Casio. Much more durable, much, I don't know. It just looks nicer, I guess. It's not the resin, the typical resin buckle. Now, something else to keep in mind is also the thickness of the strap. And when we look at the thickness of the strap, we'll take the F91 because it's it really is not a very good strap, okay? You take that one and you compare it to the AE1500 and you can see right away what we're talking about when it comes down to the thickness of the strap material itself. The AE1500 is much thicker. Now, you compare that to something like the Pathfinder, and this watch is definitely not cheap, but you can see also just the thickness that you get from the Pathfinder, the 6600Y, okay? Now this is also a true rubber strap. I mean, this is a very supple, very, very comfortable strap. Awesome when it comes down to wearing that, that particular watch. So the strap, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, the holes on the strap for Casio, these are all basically the same spacing in between the holes. And the common complaint, or at least the complaint that I have commonly, is that these holes um, provide a too tight, slightly too tight, slightly too loose. Um, or if you are lucky and you get the watch to fit right away, it'll fit right away. Um, but that's just the way they are with Casios. And frankly, there's so many other companies that use the exact same spacing on their strap that this is nothing new. All right. Next up, we're going to talk about the size of the watch itself. So you have like the F201. Or let's talk about the W217, all right? So this would be like the upgraded version of the F91. Upgraded as far as size goes, the light, a lot of different things. The strap itself, it's a longer strap, a much better strap overall. Um, but the size of the case is going to be something that will help determine like the aesthetic, what it looks like on your wrist. So for me, this is a much better fit than would be the F91. So that's the aesthetic side of it. The other thing too is that when you get into a larger style watch, you're gonna to have to worry a little bit about the height off the wrist. So it's not just the diameter or the width of the watch across this way. You're gonna to have to worry about, not worry, but you have to think about the height off the wrist. So you get something like the AE1500, 
you get a lot more height off the wrist than say, oh, uh, let's pick the other square that's up here or the other G-Shock that's up here, the square. And when you look at the height off the wrist on these two watches, okay, yeah, that's a significant difference, which means that the square is not going to catch on things like your shirt sleeve, long sleeve shirts, uh, jacket uh, sleeves that have kind of a tight cuff to them. You're not going to have as much of an issue with this being caught on those sleeves. So keep that in mind as well, that when you have something that's much taller, that uh, there's a higher possibility for that. And also that the combination between the diameter or the distance across and the distance above the wrist can determine the chunkiness of the watch. So some watches look more chunky because if they're just not as wide across, but they're just as thick up above, that means that you're going to have what I would say is more of a chunky looking watch. Both of these watches are generally the same thickness. Okay, when you take the measurement, the maximum measurement, they're about the same thickness. But when you look at the overall width, it just seems like the uh, AE 1500, this watch over here, proportionally handles the height much better on the wrist. Okay, and you can see that when you put this on the wrist, that it just feels like, looks like it sticks up higher on the wrist versus the AE 1500. Doesn't have that same proportional or disproportional feel to it because it's just wider. So that's something else that the size can play into. Next up is legibility. And the classic, and I'm going to bring the AE 1500 up here because this is the most legible watch that's out here. But another one, which is a G-Shock, the GD 350, both of these are basically the same general uh, diameter across the, the case. So when you look at these two watches, they're about the same width from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Okay? But when you look at the time, the, the legibility of these two watches is far different between these two watches. The AE1500 is much easier to read at a greater distance than would be the GD350, the G-Shock over here on the right. And that's because where, the pla where they place the time, which is in the center of the dial right here, they make the maximum use of the maximum width of the circle or of the, of the of circular case, which is right there in the middle. But when you place the time in the lower portion of a circle, you start to squeeze things together on here, and it just becomes a little more crowded. The numbers get a little bit smaller, so the legibility suffers as a result. So keep that in mind when it comes down to the legibility of the watch. Take a look at where the time is located on the watch. Here's another example. This is the CA-53 classic calculator watch all right now this is a rectangular shape but you can just see what legibility can do for a watch as far as readability so if you have reading glasses i highly recommend that you put this higher on the list as far as overall rankings or just the concern that you have as you're looking through a bunch of these casio watches next we're going to be talking about the water resistance rating now water resistance for instance this is the dbc32 the data bank um, zero water resistance so Technically, according to Casio, you don't even want to get this splashed wet. You don't want to wash your hands with this watch on. However, Casio is well known for kind of exaggerating the water resistance ratings of their watches on the safe side of the scale. So you could probably get a little water on here. It's not a huge deal, but I would not regularly get this water or this watch wet with water. Something else, uh, when you have a water resistant rating watch like this, you do get to have, like, say, for instance, the hand washing, the splashing, that, that kind of thing. It'll handle that. And I've heard more and more, like the F91, people take these out swimming. There's not a big issue with it. But you also have to kind of weigh the cost of the watch versus, um, you know, the, the value that it brings to you as far as the use goes. So if it's a high-cost watch, you know, the value is really high for you, you may, may not want to risk taking that watch out and swimming with it if it's only water-resistant rated. So, But there's other water-resistant ratings out here. You get 50 meters, you get 100 meters. Uh, let's see here. The 201 is, this is also water-resistant. Um, and they generally say this on the case, but you had the, the uh, what is it, the DW290? Yeah, the DW290. You know, this one's 200 meters of water resistance. It's not a G-Shock, but it's dang close to being a G-Shock. A lot of the G-Shocks are 100 meters or 200 meters of water resistance. But you get the idea that water resistance is kind of an important thing because if you're doing something like, for instance, for what I do, um, I plan on my watches getting a little bit sprinkled on, wet, whether it's becoming from or coming from the sprinkler systems, from being rained on, uh, you know, reaching into a, a, a bush that's really wet and it just soaks your arm, that kind of thing. So I really do have a look, see on these watches and make sure they have at least 50 meters of water resistance for the work that I do. That goes back to determining what kind of work that you're you're um, going to do with the watch. 
Next up is power source. So all of these digital watches are electronic, all right? And so you're going to have a battery of some sort, whether that's a battery be, uh, that stores electricity from a solar cell that transfers the uh, electricity from the sun into a, uh, basically a storage battery, or you have the typical two, five-year battery, whatever it happens to be, that uh, many of these watches will have, like the CA53, all these calculator watches, the 201. Okay, these are all battery-powered watches. Now, the G-Shock watches, if you get a G-Shock, you can get a 10-year battery out of the G-Shock. Sometimes, though, you don't have to get a G-Shock and get a 10-year battery. This is the W736. It has a 10-year battery. Let's see if I can get this. There you go. So you can see it's a 10-year battery. It also has 100 meters of water resistance. All right. And, you know, when it comes down to shock resistance and that whole thing that the G-Shock gets because it's a 10-year battery, 10-meter drop, and then 100 meters of water resistance, that's the general outline for a G-Shock. This watch would probably get almost all of those things. Now, the, the drop resistance... The shock resistance is probably one it would not pass necessarily, although I have torture tested some of these watches, and they come through in flying colors, still working, and I've done that with the F200, which is the cousin of this F201, and uh, it did just fine. So I don't really have an issue with these watches when it comes down to shock resistance under normal circumstances for the typical consumer, okay? But when it comes down to the battery itself, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, how long of a battery do I really want to have in the, in the watch? I would highly recommend going five years and higher, a five-year battery, 10-year battery, or tough solar. When you get into that two-year battery, you never know how long the watch has been on the shelf, you know, in the store or in the warehouse when they ship it out to you. But when you get a five-year battery, you're probably guaranteed at least three to four years of battery life for sure, especially if you're kind of a heavy user of the light stop watches and those kind of things. When you get into that 10-year battery or the tough solar, um, they're kind of interchangeable. Once you get a watch with a 10-year battery, like this W736, you're probably going to, the watch will probably not last as long as the battery if you're using this for work or if you're kind of, you know, hard on the watch. Um, some people are not hard on the watch and they change the battery and they get another 10 years out of this thing. So it's totally up to you. But at the same time, I don't think a 10-year battery is significantly, hugely different from a tough solar uh, tough solar cell. Now, the tough solar cell, there's a bunch of these that are out here. The Cassioke is one. The Pathfinder is another one. And then we also have the Square. These are all tough solar. Um, these are also radio controlled. That's another function that's in there. But um, you just have a low maintenance. You just really don't have to worry about it. I have, I've had a Pathfinder now, um, the model, for the past 20, 35 years. Is it 35 years now? Close to 30 years. And I've had one watch where the battery lasted for more than 15 years. It's still going, and it hasn't been changed out. So uh, these batteries in these tough solar watches, uh, they last quite a while. Next up is function. When we're looking at these watches, we want to look at the basic functions of the Casio watch. Let's go back to the most popular watch that's out there by sales. Almost 4 million of these watches are sold annually. So that means you know, 4 million, 4 million, like that's an incredible number. So this watch has the alarm, it has the stopwatch, and that's it. Very basic functions. That's the most basic that I've ever seen in a Casio. And frankly, there's not a lot that you can't do with the alarm that the, the timer does, because the alarm is a timer. The stopwatch is great. Dual time, yeah, I don't know, you can get dual time in there. But, but as far as basic function, the F91 covers the bases on that. You can get into something like a calculator watch, the CA53. This is the watch that was uh, used in the Back to the Future movie. Um, and you have the different functions as well. You have the calculator function, you have an alarm, you have dual time and stopwatch. What you don't have on here is the timer. And so for me, what I like to have the basics as far as a basic functioning watch, let's go back to the AE 1500 because I really like this watch. Um, you're going you're gonna to have the alarm and you're going to have multiple alarms. I love having multiple alarms. Ideally, I want to be able to program the alarm. So when I hold this down here and I go up here, I can actually program the day of the month and the month. And I can have this alarm go off one time on that day at that particular time. So to me, those are great features for uh, an alarm. Having multiple alarms, I think, is great. Having five alarms is awesome. Um, so just something to think about when it comes down to your alarm functions. Timer is another one. I love a watch that has a, a timer on there because to me, the timer is something that really is helpful, like for cooking, those kind of things where I don't really want to go through the motion of setting the alarm, which basically is another timer, but I can go in here, set the timer. And, uh, you know, this is preset to a minute. You know, I usually have mine set at a minute, five minutes or 10 minutes, somewhere in there. And those usually cover a lot of situations where I'm timing something. Okay. 
So timing is another function that I really like. Um, the chronograph, the stopwatch function, you know, you get into some of these other watches here. Let's pull up the 201. And uh, pretty straightforward. You're going to have a lap function. Oops, I passed it. You're going to have the lap function on here. So... <coughs> Let's see here. There's the split. Okay. And then you hit it up again, and you can see it just jumps right back to its running time. Stop, reset, and so forth. So stopwatch is great. Um, great for those short, quick timing functions that you need to time something um, as far as the elapsed time goes. Um, also, you have some... <laughs> we're going to go up here with the uh, Pathfinder because the Pathfinder is kind of the kitchen sink. This one has the altimeter. It has the barometer. It has the compass. It has the temperature. Um, and this one, you when you turn the watch, the second hand will point to north, okay? Um, you also have the Tough Solar on here, which is great for low maintenance, grab and go. It also has atomic timekeeping, which also means that it's adjusted once a day. And for those areas that have that atomic, atomic timekeeping uh, broadcast, it's very helpful. If you don't, these watches are generally pretty accurate that you don't have to really change the time very often to adjust. As a matter of fact, if you're in daylight savings time, you're automatically adjusting it twice a year anyway, because without the atomic timekeeping function, you need to adjust the time to get yourself back into daylight savings and so on. So those are all things I think that are really helpful when it comes down to the different types of functions that are out there. You also have the tide and the moon, which is another great one. And, and the one that I'm kind of curious about is the health. My wife, I picked her up a very cheap step counter, and she loves the watch. It's the perfect size. It tells her the steps. Uh, very basic kind of a watch, and she's using it all the time right now. And, and so you can get some of those health features in there as well. Next up is light. Now, light, I'm going to show you a little bit of video here of the F91 because this is the example of what is just pathetic when it comes to a light where just half the screen is lit up by one LED. And then if you step up into the W217, which is just kind of the larger version of it, you can get a light that goes all the way across the screen and tells you everything, shows you everything that you need to know about the watch. Now, some of the other watches that are out there, like the Square, will have what's kind of like an electroluminescence. Now the 5600 is electroluminescent, which means the entire watch glows, kind of like the Timex Indiglo. This model, the 5610, uses an LED, but the dispersal of the light on the display, it almost looks like a uh, electroluminescent type thing. You're also gonna have the, on the Anti Digi, uh, these are all luminous hands, luminous number markers. And then you also have the light, which is here at the 6 o'clock position. That's something to keep in mind, too. I love the light button being at the 6 o'clock position because when the light is at the 6 o'clock position, it frees up the other uh, buttons to do fewer things that are easier to remember. So to me, the light is a really important thing. Consider where the light button location is. Consider the strength of it. Sometimes they have two LEDs. Sometimes they have one. I think this one has two LEDs, if I remember right. Last but not least is G-Shock or no G-Shock. Now, this is a video that I've done on whether or not G-Shock is actually worth it. Let's see, here. where's my other G-Shock? Here it is. So I've got three G-Shocks here, and of course, with the G-Shock with the G-Shock name, you end up with um, all kinds of qualifications. 100 meters of water resistance, minimum. A 10-year battery, minimum. And you also have a 10-meter drop resistance rating, minimum, okay? Are they over-engineered? Probably. Uh, you're going to find that all of these watches out here can almost always check all of those boxes as well. Now, they may not check the box on the 10 meter drop, or they may not check the box on the battery. But when it comes down to just general toughness for the consumer, I don't think you're going to be able to abuse these watches enough under the typical circumstances to really warrant, you know, buying a G-Shock to get that extra toughness in there. Okay. Frankly, the G-Shock, it's great. They're, they do a great job. They have the shock resistance. They have the, the, the standards built into them. There's no doubt about it. They have a heavier strap. They have a heavier buckle. There's all kinds of things that you get with a G-Shock. I think most G-Shocks have a good value. I think some of the higher end G-Shocks are overrated. You know, when you get into the, the range master, is it the range master, frogman, I can't remember which one it is, when it comes down to the comparable for the triple sensor Pathfinder, I just don't think the value is there. I think the Pathfinder is a better value. It's, it has all of those things, 100 meters of water resistance, excellent, excellent strap, mineral crystal. That's something else, by the way, that you get with a G-Shock. You get a mineral crystal rather than the acrylic, which is softer, mineral, harder. Um, 
So that is something else I think the G-Shock also has a value. So to, G to go with G-Shock or not, sometimes, I, most of the time, I think people, when they get it, it's more about the name and not really about the functions. And that's okay. Uh, but just know that the, the toughness level of many of these watches, for instance, the W736, okay? This watch has 100 meters of water resistance, a 10-year battery. Um, it has a vibrate alert, which is awesome. Uh, so there's all kinds of things about these watches that I think really do a good job and you're not having to pay the price of a G-Shock. Now, what I didn't mention under functions, I'm going to cover this right now. One more thing is on the alarm side or the alert notification side is the vibrate alert or the flash alert. OK, so the typical watch is going to have here's the, is the SW, S, SGW 500. I almost said SWG SGW 500, which is a compass thermometer. Any did you watch very close cousin to the Pathfinder? Um, but when it comes down to the alert, uh, you're gonna have the typical beeping sound, right? So that's the audio alert, and that is the sound that you can hear with the alarm. That's the sound that you hear with a timer. Now, if you have something like the W36, you have the vibrate alert. We'll get that going here in just a second. I'm gonna put that on my wrist so that you can hear what that sounds like on the wrist because the question came up um, on one of the Casio videos I did just recently from one of the viewers about just the, the volume of the the sound of the vibrate alert on the wrist. Now one of the reasons, many there's a couple of reasons I wear this watch. Number one, for discrete notifications. Let's say I have a meeting I have to get to or whatever, I have something I've, I've got timed and I have to leave or I have to go do something, but I'm gonna be in a group setting and I don't wanna interrupt the, the, the rest of the group. If I'm wearing one of these kinds of watches, It'll vibrate on my wrist. There's no audio alarm, and I can I can feel it. No issue. Or if I'm in a loud circumstance, loud conditions, like working on something outside, the chainsaw is going, and I've got a timer. I've got to go on a phone call or whatever. I can feel this, even though I won't hear the audio piece. So, to me, the vibrate alert is a great alert notification system on the watch, and I wish more of them had it. So here you're going to hear the the alert go off. I'll put it by the mic. Okay, and this is about eight inches, 10 inches away from the mic. Okay, so I think it's it's negligible if someone sitting next to you is going to be able to hear that vibrate alert go off on your wrist. And uh, the question was kind of like, well, it's going to sound like somebody's phone is vibrating and they're gonna, everybody's going to be checking their pockets for their phone. Maybe, um, but I don't think that's that big a deal. Now, you can get both. And so with the GD350, what I love about this, first of all, it has the vibrate alert. It also has the audio alert, which is the beeping sound. But tied to that, it also flashes on the, uh, the light flashes on the display. So when I have it on audio mode, I get audio and visual. And when I have it on vibrate mode, vibrate mode, I only get the vibrate mode, which I have. If I ever have a vibrate uh, notification on a watch, I always use the vibrate notification because I know I'll always feel it. I don't know that I'll always hear it. OK, now I don't use this for an uh, alarm clock. If I was to use, use this for an alarm clock, I definitely use the audio. Okay, now the audio piece, check out the video I just did on this. When you get into G-Shocks or higher water resistant rated watches, you're going to have a softer audio alarm. So you're not going to hear it as well. So keep that in mind too, so that when you have a watch like the Casio, the F91, real basic five, or $15 to $10 watch, something like that, has a very loud beep. Okay, but you get into a G-Shock and it's much quieter. Okay, so that's the tendency. And then check out the video. It's, it's fairly short, but it just talks about that. And I graphed the results that I have on a decibel test, which was really raw, but it was a, a comparison between the watches. And you can see that when it comes down to the, the alarm notification, I think that's a really important piece. I didn't mention it with the functions, but it's something to consider overall with the watch when you're looking for something that's maybe more discreet or if you're looking for something that's louder. Maybe it is your alarm clock on tr uh, travel. You know, if you're going traveling, um, you want to make sure you have an alarm clock that you are familiar with. And so, you know, you take this watch. This, by the way, actually, this was the loudest watch. Believe it or not, out of that test, it was the DBC32 was the loudest watch. Yeah. And, you know, you're kind of splitting hairs a little bit, you know, loud compared to the other ones. The other ones weren't that much quieter, but this was the loudest one. So there you go. There's the top 10 list.
of the things that you really should consider before buying a Casio watch. I hope this is helpful. Put in the comments down below what you think of this as far as ideas go. Um, what Casio watches are you interested in getting, that kind of thing. This is just kind of an open-ended question for everybody just to kind of add, like, what do you think of these characteristics? What do you think of some of those Casio watches out there for a first-time or second-time Casio purchase? So there you go. My name's Tim. There's been another Real Ideal Gear review. Check out my website, realidealgear.com, for some of these kind of watches that I have for sale. Some of these watches will also have a flashlight paired up with it because, you know, it's a cheaper watch, cheaper flashlight. You get kind of a two-for-one deal. Um, but I also have other analog watches out there that I've tested. So check out the website, realidealgear.com, and we'll catch you guys next time.